All right, it is noon, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Welcome everyone to the third installment of the breakout sessions for Remote Learning Week. Um, I saw some familiar names coming in uh, to the audience, so welcome back if you have already attended some sessions this week. If you haven't, welcome to this session. Um, today we're going to be discussing teaching tactics for remote learning. For anyone who's new to the audience who didn't uh, maybe attend these sessions at the beginning of this week, um, the reason we're hosting these breakout sessions is because we hosted our remote learning summit on Friday uh, and we received so many questions from the audience for, you know, how to uh, facilitate remote learning most effectively, uh, student engaged teaching tactics, technology tools, things like that. We couldn't fit all of those great questions into the summit on Friday, so we decided to host these breakout sessions this week so that we could get all of your questions answered and continue the conversation. Um, so just to give everyone an overview again of the rest of this week, we're nearing the end of the sessions, but Monday we had a great conversation with Eric Geis on digital equity and student engagement. Yesterday, Sean Coffrin joined us to talk about communication, collaboration, and coaching tactics. Today, we're talking with Sarah Margison about teaching tactics for remote learning. And then tomorrow, we're wrapping up Remote Learning Week with um, Melanie Lejeune talking about technology tools for remote learning. Um, on Friday of this week as well, we're going to be hosting a dino-centered event. Um, we received a lot of questions about what Dino does, who we are, and how our technology um, and our software can help support teachers uh, during remote learning. So on Friday, we're going to be having a conversation with Devin Arms, who is actually the director of technology at Tippy Canoe, where Sarah is from, um, and Casey Higgs, who's a school success manager at Dino. It'll be a great conversation about, you know, how teachers use Dino in the classroom, and then on the flip side, how teachers are using Dino to facilitate remote learning. So we're really excited for that. Um, today we'll be talking with Sarah Margison, like I said, about teaching tactics for remote learning. Um, we received a lot of really great questions about coaching tactics, technology tools, and most of the questions we received were about teaching tactics and student engagement. So um, I asked Sarah if she could join us for a breakout session to dive deeper into this top topic. Um, even though she's not a teacher, um, she's a tech coach, so she deals directly with teachers. So I think she's going to have some really great insight into um, those teaching tactics. So before we dive into this, just want to give a few plugs for um, things that we have going on at Dino. Uh, we have our Tech Coach Con Facebook community, which you are probably already a part of if you're in this um, if you're in this event right now, because we're only giving access to people in the community. Additionally, if you're part of that community, I highly encourage you to go ahead and subscribe to our Tackling Tech podcast. We have great stories on there from different educators from all over the country about how they're facilitating remote learning, as well as just how they facilitate uh, technology integration and student engagement throughout the year outside of remote learning. Um, in addition to that, go to our YouTube channel. We always post the um, sessions from Remote Learning Week, from Remote Learning Summit and Tech Coaching Conference on there so you can go back and watch these as many times as you want to get all of the information and uh, get professional development from them. So uh, I think that's all that I have to plug today, but Sarah, let's dive into this conversation. I'm going to stop sharing my screen um, and welcome. Hopefully all of you can see us okay. Uh, Sarah, do you want to introduce yourself really quickly? Sure, I'll give my traditional spiel about myself. Uh, my name is Sarah Margison. I'm the coordinator of Connected Learning at the Tippecanoe School Corporation in Lafayette, Indiana. Um, we're the surrounding county um, for Purdue. So if you're familiar with Purdue University in Indiana, we're that, that school corporation. We've got about 14,000 students and 800 teachers. And I work in 20 different buildings to just help support technology initiatives um, in the classroom. So I work a lot with our curriculum department, with our technology department, student services, just about everybody to make sure that um, our teachers feel confident in using technology in the classroom and then especially right now using technology in a remote learning um, setting. Before this, I was a high school math teacher and I have a master's in learning design and technology, which is coming in very handy right now. <laughs> I'm sure. Uh, it seems like a lot of uh, kind of interests that people had prior to remote learning are being especially useful now. Um, yeah. So today we'll be talking about teaching tactics. Um, just to get the conversation started, can you talk a little bit about 
what requests you've um, seen come out more from teachers now with remote learning that maybe weren't as big of um, a concern before remote learning? Yeah, so I would say, I wanna say that I'm gonna, I'm gonna touch on four things, but we'll see how many I actually get to when I start this. So number one, and I'm sure this is for everybody, but the idea of video conferencing with students. So still some kind of like face-to-face -face sort of interaction with the kids but in different locations. That's been obviously number one request. Um, the second request was, we're seeing a lot of conversations about um, students or and teachers don't understand maybe how to exchange assignments digitally 100% of the time, right? So sometimes they would be exchanging assignments digitally, but not all the time and not across the board K-12. And so I just think that maybe teachers and students weren't as prepared to go 100% digital exchange of assignments and that assignment workflow. That was number two. The third one is going to be the um, sharing of information and delivery of instruction again 100% digital so i mean some of the things some of our teachers are still doing uh, packets for students that need it but most of the teachers are being asked to deliver content and instruction and instructional resources digitally and they maybe didn't feel super prepared to do that or they didn't feel like they needed to prepare to do that. And so now they're, you know, being asked to do some of those things. And then um, the fourth one is just the communication between teacher, parent, and student. You know, expectations and making sure the parents understand if the parents are going to be supporting their students in logging into various tools, um, how how can they support their students and what about their devices and how do they support those things and all that. So I would say those are, those are probably the four big things that our team is handling like on a daily basis. That makes a lot of sense. And I think um, communication has obviously been a big theme of all of these conversations and each of those really tie into, you know, how to communicate mm -hmm. um, with parents, with teachers, with the rest of your team. Um, so kind of first question in relation to teaching tactics, what does a typical remote learning schedule look like for a student and for a teacher? Um, and really this kind of depends on, in, in our case, it depends on the school, it depends on the, the level, the, the grade, all that kind of stuff. And it really depends on the teacher too, what their expectations might be um, coming from, I have a first grade son and so, we right now um, for our district, we are doing remote learning Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and Tuesday and Thursday are like teacher work days, but the students don't have any um, maybe expectations or they're not having to sit in on classes and things like that. So on a typical Monday, Wednesday, Friday, there might be various activities that he has to engage in that could take probably anywhere from like, I don't know, five to 20 minutes per subject. And what, what I think has been very interesting, and this is the same thing for the teachers too, is that there's so much more choice in this remote learning environment than there would ever be in the classroom, right? He wakes up in the morning, my son wakes up in the morning, he comes down and I say, okay, these are the things that we need to accomplish today what do you want to do first, right? So he kind of gets to decide, he's in the driver's seat in terms of what he wants to accomplish throughout his day. And if it's nice outside, then we go play outside for a little bit. And then we come back and we continue to, to work on the, the things that are being asked of him. Our teachers really have that flexibility as well. They have autonomy in their classrooms. Um, both in their normal classrooms and as well as their remote learning classrooms and and so a typical day for them now they still are required to um, it's office hours be available for students I think it's maybe just not letting an email sit from you know 8 30 in the morning and not answer it until the next day you know just get, obviously staying up with communication but they're really expected to be on from like 8 30 to 11 and I believe it's like I don't know, one to 3.30, something along those lines. What we're finding though, and I'm even finding this in my job, is 
that we're on all the time, right? Like we're, we're available pretty much all the time. And the parents, even if the parents are reaching out to the teacher in the evening, they're still getting responses from the teachers, which is wonderful. I mean, it's obviously not expected. It's nice that they're, that they're still doing that kind of communication because I think what's important to consider when you're looking at communicating with parents and teachers and work schedules and stuff right now is that while most of us are home, not everybody is. And so a kid might be doing their remote learning work at 4 p.m. You know, when we would normally think that they're, that we're signed off, really, they could still be signed on. And that's when they're starting their remote learning work. And that just is, we just have a lot of flexibility then throughout the day. So I would say there is sort of typical hours, but not necessarily so rigid that they're not able to be flexible and choice and time and all that. Yeah, I think it's definitely a lot harder to turn off after the work day that we have now because there's no separation between, you know, your work life and your home life. It's all yes. kind of one. Um, and that compassion for people who are, you know, on different schedules than us, mm -hmm. we all want to be there for each other during this time. Um, that sense of autonomy and flexibility really interests me. And I think that's a huge part of this is students are realizing that maybe the school day isn't, um, you know, set in stone, but they can kind of Mm -hmm. um, have some choice. Same thing with teachers. Do you think that's something that will translate over into, you know, school day um, once we go back to traditional learning? I can, I can only hope that that will be the case. I really <laughs> hope that that will be the case because I also think that we're going to get students that are going to come back in the fall and they're not going to really put up with like, you have to be here and do this and it's very rigid and, and follow these rules. And it's like, yeah, but I still learned and I maybe got a lot out of the learning experiences that I had and they weren't super rigid or I had a little bit more choice. And we're going to um, see products come out of, of this time where our students might be um, more familiar with different technology pieces. And so I have always advocated for choice in how students demonstrate their learning. And I'm hoping that that's one of the big pieces that's taken out of this time is in the fall when a teacher assigns a research project and a student comes up and says, I want to present my research in this way. A teacher says, sure, go ahead, you know, figure it out. Let us know what you find, have fun with it, you know, because that's what they're really able to do right now is the teachers like figure out how you're going to demonstrate your learning to me. What are you going to choose to research? How are you going to show that research? What technology tools do you have available to you and, and go at it? You know, I saw a quote this morning from somebody that said, I think the thing that's um, becoming more apparent is that we need to teach students um, how to learn and not what to learn. That's because that, point. yeah, no, that's a, that's a life, lifetime skill is how to learn. How am I learning? Not necessarily what am I learning? Cause that's really the important part. Yeah. And even which learning styles, you know, they might yeah. be more accustomed to and work better for them. Um, in our conversation on Monday with Eric guys, he was talking a lot about that creativity and creating mm -hmm. passion projects for students. And that sounds exactly like what you're talking about with having students kind of find their way to creating these projects and creating mm -hmm. the learning rather than giving them an assignment um, or a question to answer. Um, kind of staying on that same track, we had a question come in asking, what are ways of giving students creative thinking and understanding assessments that don't create pages of reading for a teacher to grade? I think um, utilizing family as much as possible and community as much as possible and family like the family looks different for everybody, obviously, and community looks different for everyone, but um, giving students more authentic real life critical thinking experiences now that you, they may have tools available to them at home that they wouldn't necessarily have at school. So for instance, today is Earth Day, right? So we, our students might have more of an opportunity to actually go out and do something, picking up trash in the neighborhood or just, you know, coming up with a recycling plan for their family, that kind of stuff. That's like, it's way more creative and um, sort of blows out the walls of the school 
beyond what we could do when we were in a traditional classroom. The classroom stuff, I think we were kind of rigid in thinking like, what could we do in our classroom? And now it's like, what can you do in the community, right? So, so I think we're definitely giving students or we have the opportunity right now to give students a global platform to use those critical thinking skills. And I think that's gonna be super important to harness that global platform that they have now that they're not inside of the walls of our school throughout the day. Yeah, definitely. I think that's a great point. And one of my favorite quotes from Friday's summit was when you said that, you know, students are in this whole new environment, which is their home, which creates these totally new learning experiences for them. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's so important. Um, how can we better facilitate collaborative tasks with younger students? So year four and below. So my son, my other son is five. And so, you know, he's, he's young. Um, and again, I think harnessing the power of the people that are in that child's community in this time is going to be um, super important. So um, I am a very involved parent. And so it's really hard for me to step back and let the kids do things themselves. And I'm also very creative and very type A when I create things. So to let my kids create posters or something by themselves is very difficult <laughs> for me <laughs> to just sort of let them go at it and color things the wrong color right so <laughs> but I think with the with the younger students um giving them an opportunity to work with mom and dad on things or work with guardians or older siblings I think there can be there's so much learning that can happen right now between younger siblings and older siblings, you know, that can be really, really exciting and very powerful, giving them a project to do together that maybe neither of them are very, very, um, uh, what do I want to say? That, that they have a lot of knowledge about, right? Um, and and again, I'm, I'm going to constantly go back to putting projects together that involve things in the home, right? Gardening right now is going to be big, especially in Indiana, we finally have sunshine. You know, things around the house that the, that the child can help with is going to be super important. And understanding that they might be little, but they have a lot of capacity to learn these new things um, and still collaborate. And honestly, I've seen plenty of students that are still on Zooms or Google Meets with their classmates. So still giving them the opportunity to connect with their classmates would be important. It's kind of a, a zoo when they get on there, but they love it. They love being able to still see each other's faces and still communicate with their friends. Yeah, I love the point about um, older siblings. That's something that I hadn't even thought about. Um, as a parent, is this kind of opening doors for you to realize maybe how parents could, I guess, get a better idea of what their students are learning and how they're learning and how to maybe be more involved with that going forward? Yeah, I mean, that's that 100%. That's huge. The, uh, the amount of parents, and I'm sure the teachers would say the same thing, the amount of parents that maybe had no clue wh what was happening or what their students might be learning are now super involved in the learning process, right? They're super involved in helping their students with things, especially when they're, we're talking about younger grades, maybe K through two that might not be giving homework on a regular basis my son's school in first grade, the only homework is the spelling test. So the only time that we got to experience learning with, with him was pulling our hair out, trying to get him to just practice his spelling words. Now we get to do science experience, experiments with him. We get to look on Google Maps to study maps of, of our area. We get to create Earth Day posters. We get to do Flipgrid with him. So we get to do all these fun learning activities that it's like, oh, this is what you do all day, <laughs> right? So it's just some fun things that, that parents can now be involved in. And I think, again, moving forward, I think more parents are going to want to know what kind of things are happening in the classroom. Because I think what everybody is realizing right now is that this might not be the only time that something like this happens in our life. And, and so we need to make sure that we're prepared for the next time this does happen. Definitely. And especially um, even for snow days or, you know, things like that where we can compensate now with a remote learning structure rather than lo losing those days. Mm -hmm. And if the parents are involved in that, that makes it even easier to do. Um, what kind of resources are your teachers providing for parents to help them kind of facilitate this learning at home? 
Um, depending on the teacher, they're, uh, they're providing various resources. A lot of our teachers are use, utilizing their websites as much as possible, especially our specials teachers that might not have something like an LMS set up like Google Classroom or Canvas. They might not have that, that arena for the students already. So they're really utilizing Google, um, Google Sites, which is our, our teacher web pages, to get information out to students. But I also think, honestly, you're, they're bringing the content to the families. Where are most of our families connecting with the school? on Facebook. And that's fine, right? So they're utilizing their Facebook pages to do read alouds, to do music lessons, to do art lessons, to do PE challenges. So there's a lot of engagement that's happening with the families across platforms like Facebook and even Twitter. And, and that's fine. And you're, they're bringing the content to the people where they want it, right? Where it's going to be the easiest because they're realizing that parents aren't checking email, parents aren't checking Google Classroom, but they are checking Facebook. So let's post things there and get them to engage with the students there. Yeah, kind of finding those channels that work yes. the best to get to someone when you want to talk to them. Um, mm -hmm. Switching gears a little bit to um, more student focused, how do you, I guess, what ideas have your teachers come up with or you come up with to keep students motivated throughout this time? Because I'm sure there, it kind of comes in ebbs and flows of students you know, being really excited about remote learning and then getting sick of it and then maybe getting excited again. How do you kind of keep that motivation up? I think um, one is choice, choice in the students learning, right? Not so rigid, not as rigid as we normally would be in the classroom, um, giving them an opportunity to um, engage in their world right now make sure that you're telling the students go outside for 10 minutes because the, I bet they'll do that, right? They, they may, you may not be able to get them to do something else for 10 minutes, but if you tell them, you, okay, you have to go do this activity outside for 10 minutes or, you know, making something again, I'm, I'll, I'll always go back to engaging the environment that they're in at the time, because all those resources that we would normally have in the classroom, we don't have anymore, but they have a, a whole set of resources now that they can be using. So, so choice, engaging in their environment, and communication is so important right now, listening to your students and differentiation. I mean, that is got it. That has to be like one of the number one priorities for teachers at this time is differentiating the tasks for students because most of the time, if a student doesn't complete a task or they're unmotivated, it's because they're bored, right? Because they already know the content or it's too challenging for them and they don't feel like even if they spent the time on it, that they would be able to complete the task to mastery, right? So looking at mastery learning and how can we create tasks for students where they feel like if I spend the 20 minutes or 30 minutes that my teacher wants me to on this task, I will feel accomplished at the end of that 30 minutes. I won't feel defeated. So even some of our teachers have said to parents, if your frustration level goes up during this task, stop. Don't do it. Don't worry. You know, we don't want to put more stress on families right now. We don't want to put more stress on students. So just listening to the students, communicating with them and saying, what do you need from me to be successful in this course at this time? Um, differentiation is a great topic to bring up. Can you kind of describe how a teacher might identify those students that might need um, a little more explaining or uh, maybe something harder or uh, less challenging for them and then kind of how to differentiate that lesson or that assignment for those students? Yeah, I think, I mean, it can be as simple as like just a self-assessment for the for the students because I think sometimes we forget that if we just ask the kid, they might tell us, I don't understand this information or this information is too easy for me, right? So just a, a quick self-assessment. And I even do that with my teachers when I'm talking about new technology tools. I don't want to go over things that they already know how to do. I want to move on and, and continue with, with the topic. So, um, you know, asking self-assessment sort of questions, but then also even getting into formative questions, right? Formative assessments can be very valuable during this time and can help lead students to a path where they can then challenge themselves and learn new materials and all that. So there are programs obviously that will do that for them, but even engaging in things like Google Forms and just sending out like, hey, here's our baseline assessment, right? And making sure that we're asking questions that students can't just Google right now. We wanna ask 
questions that they're actually going to have to analyze the content so that we can understand if they know what they're supposed to know. And, and really, um, if we're in a space where we might have multiple subjects, so, so middle school, high school, talking with the students, other teachers to understand, like, are they engaging in the content in your class or are they not engaged across the board with everybody and who do we need to recruit to make sure that students are actually engaging in that content. But I think differentiation can really start with those self assessments, formative assessments, just getting, you know, getting as much data as we can about the students and you might have some of that data leading into depending on how your um, school year was going. I know we were actually just at the end of third quarter and re ready to start fourth quarter. So we have, you know, half a semester's worth of data on students to be able to then customize some of that learning going into the end of the year. That makes a lot of sense. Um, yeah, and definitely going into next year, I'm sure having that extra data will definitely help. Um, how do you best support students who have access but may not be participating in completing those assignments? Again, I, communication is is key because I think there's going to be a reason, right? There is a reason that they don't want to engage in the content. And so what is that reason? I mean, I taught high school math, so I understand students even coming into my classroom and not wanting to be there. They may have liked me as a person, but they still don't want to learn algebra and that's all right, right? But still making them understand that there are still going to be requirements, there are still going to be things that they're going to need to know, and are there tasks that they can engage in that may be um, less boring for them, honestly? Like, are there, are there other tools that I can be using to make sure that, because normally I might be able to convince a student if we're standing face to face, I might be able to convince them to engage in the work. But if we're across a computer, I may not be able to. And I might have to, you know, call on mom and dad and say, okay, what's happening at home? Do they have an opportunity to learn these things? Are they doing other activities right now that they're super engaged in that I could maybe pull um, some of those similar themes and, and apply them to some of the learning tasks that I'm giving them? If we give the students choice, though, I think we'll see less of that. When I, if I come in on Wednesday morning and I say, okay, this one thing is what you're doing today, then what other choice do they have besides, okay, I'm going to do it and I'm going to engage in it or I'm not versus where I'm going to come in Wednesday, I'm going to say, okay, I've got like four or five ways that you could learn this content and that you could show me that you know what you're talking about. Do any of them, do all of them. I don't care, but do at least one of them. That, yeah, that totally makes sense. Um, so for districts who um, might be, you know, not allowing teachers to uh, record or video with any students um, while teaching, um, what are some ways that they can interact with students asynchronously using maybe Zoom, Google Classroom, any other platforms um, so that they can still have that interaction, maybe not in real time? Um, I think Flipgrid is a huge opportunity for t for students and teachers, and that is going to be locked down so that there, if there are privacy concerns with students in videos, then you know, go ahead and, and set up a Flipgrid for students to be able to engage, especially asynchronously, because that's going to be really important for them. Um, I also think that using tools like Loom or Screencastify, something that would allow you to record your screen or even record your webcam, because I could be engaging in this conversation right now and not be recording my screen, but just be recording my webcam. And I'm still going to get the content that I talked, that we talked about during the webinar, but maybe not any of the students faces or names or conversations that were on my screen at the time if we're thinking about like student data privacy and stuff i'm glad somebody asked that question because that's a huge concern right now i just don't think that people are thinking about what am i sharing about my kids can their pictures actually be online you know are, do i have parent permission to do xyz with them over a computer yeah, and I think it's it's a really exciting time to be able to say that we're making it work and yes. people get, you know, really excited about sharing that, but, you know, taking that step back and seeing if that's the right thing or even, you know, the legal thing to do um, mm -hmm. is really important. Uh, so we talked a little bit already about, you know, getting kids to go outside, make posters, things like that. We had a question come in about 
um, I'm assuming from an arts or music teacher um, asking how to engage students in, you know, physical, physical activities or lessons involving the arts like music. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think challenges right now are going to be huge. So I've already talked about choice, but specifically choice boards. So think of like a bingo card with activities for them to do. And you could even partner up. So like the art, music, and PE teach all teacher all partner up and they create choice boards for the students and they fill those out and maybe the student wins uh, lunch with the principal next year or something along those lines, right? So you incentivize some of those activities for the students just like we do, right? I wear a Fitbit because it counts my steps and I can be in competitions and I can win stuff, right? I Not that I wouldn't normally walk, but I walk a lot more because I have a Fitbit and it's going to be the same thing for some of our kids. And, and that, that translates beyond just our specials. So what if the choice board was like activities all surrounding Earth Day, like various things that they could do and they like a bingo card. Um, I, in addition to what I do for our corporation, I also am on a team for our health and wellness initiative. And so a lot of, a lot of these things that we're talking about is what I still do with the adults that I'm trying to engage in health and wellness initiative activities. You know, what kind of incentives can I put out there for the kids that probably don't cost me anything Right. And say I'm the music teacher, then if they if they go through however many activities that I have and they fill out the sheet and send it to me, however, then maybe I write a little song with their name in it. That doesn't cost me any money to do something like that. I'm the art teacher. I'm going to I'm going to paint them something and I'm going to mail it. My kid would lose his mind if he saw that. Right. <laughs> or even just a shout out on, on their video. You utilizing incentives as silly as it sounds we you know we shouldn't incentivize what they're having they should are they should just be you know intrinsically motivated to do the these things well they're not right now and we, and we know that that our mental state right now may be preventing them especially if their home life isn't great that may be preventing them from being intrinsically motivated to engage in your work so can i incentivize it just a little bit just a little bit so that they feel like yeah, I'll do that. You know, I'll, I just did an interview earlier today for a hundred dollar gift card. Great. I will do it. I'll fill out your survey. <laughs> so I think our students are the same way and, and those prizes don't have to cost us anything. Yeah. I think the incentives and the competition is even a great way to get, you know, students engaged with each other and their teachers and create kind of some excitement about it. Um, that made me think of a thread that I saw on Twitter it was maybe a week ago now, but it was a parent and teacher talking about how her student, uh, you know, didn't want to do the writing assignment that she had. And a an author replied to it and said, um, you know, tell her to jump on a call with me. I'll like create a sketch for her while she does her writing assignment, as long as it takes her, send it to her after to give like a bit of motivation during that. Yeah. So I think in like little things like that, where students feel like, someone's returning the favor because I'm yes. sure during this time they feel very alone because they're working alone. So making it more of a group activity where they're getting something in return for that um, can be really motivating for students. Yeah. Um, so in terms of grading um, assessments and integrity and things like that, um, how are teachers at your school grading and um, there's a few questions in this question. So first off, how are student, how are teachers grading? Um, second, what about students who aren't doing the work? And third, how are assessments being handled overall? Um, that is gonna vary by building. I will put that caveat in there. Um, my son's teacher is not um, formally like um, collecting grades, but there are still like spelling tests and reading quizzes and that kind of stuff. So it's more of like, check for understandings versus I'm taking this as a grade. Um, depending on the level, you know, the buildings and stuff, um, they're, they're still giving some maybe weekly assessments, things like that. Um, my husband is actually an AP social studies teacher. And so his students are preparing for the AP exam. So that's really kind of the assessment. And at this point now he's giving them resources to help prepare them for that exam. And so again, he's, he's one of those where it's like, look, you've got these five things that you could do. Show me which ones you end up doing. Um, but I, I think right now it's going to be really important for teachers to think about why am I assessing the student? Right? Am I just assessing to see if they're engaging in the content? 
if that's the only thing that I want to know, did you engage in the content? Did you watch this or do this or X, Y, Z? Can my assessment um, maybe not be a multiple choice test, right? Or even, you know, having them do a quiz on Google Forms or Canvas or something, because I just want to see, did you engage in the content? So maybe it's more of a survey sort of assessment um, where I just, I just want to see their thoughts. And maybe I'm asking some more open-ended questions about the content. Um, if I still need to assess for grades, because I know that there are still some schools that are taking grades, then I would look at doing assessments for mastery because there is really, at this point, um, either you need to revamp all of your assessments to make sure that the students cannot Google the answers, or you need to um, just do it for mastery and allow the students, make sure that they understand that all you're looking for is for them to be able to understand the content. And the way that you're finding out if they understand the content is by giving them this assessment. So if they don't get everything right the first time, that's okay. Go back in and do it again. You know, check your work and do it again, something along those lines. Now for the students that are just not doing anything, I mean, I think that's the big question. I don't think that's a huge part of the population. I think we're gonna have, um, I think we're gonna have hills and valleys with student engagement, right? My son last week on Monday had a bad day. So he was not doing anything. And there wasn't anything I was gonna to do to convince him to do any schoolwork. And as a parent, I thought, oh well, it's fine. It's one day on Wednesday, we'll get back to it and it will be fine. And his teacher checked in. She said, you know, I haven't seen him. It was everything okay? I said, yeah, he just had a bad day and that was it, you know? So um, looking, giving students a longer opportunity maybe to engage in some of the content. If we think, man, they should sign in on Monday morning and be really excited to do this assignment. They might not be, <laughs> they might have a headache that day or their parents might be out. Um, maybe they're still working and they have to watch their siblings that day. So just being more flexible on, on what you're asking students to do and in what time frame, and then just constant communication with the parents and the students about what you expect, because I think sometimes we don't get enough student engagement. We expect this, we wrote in our expectations this, right? And students are maybe just below that middle line. And it's like, well, I expected them to do that. Well, did you tell them that that's what you expected? Because you need to be very clear during this time. This is the level of engagement I expect from everybody. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I think um, Brett had a conversation with Erica Rodriguez, who's a teacher at Klein ISD in Texas, and she was basically saying, like, the biggest thing everyone needs to think about right now is kind of your own mental, physical well-being, and I think yes. that's crucial for, you know, teachers, parents, students to all take into consideration is you know, school comes first, but before that comes making sure that, you know, students are doing okay, that they're not having a bad day. And if they mm -hmm. are, they need a day off. And I think as teachers too, um, just making sure you're putting yourself first in this mm -hmm. scenario, because this is hard for everyone. Um, yeah. I think the isolation in itself can be um, really challenging, especially not having, you know, colleagues and coworkers and your students right there with you. Mm -hmm. um, kind of staying on the assessment track. And this is the last question that we have before we start to wrap it up. Um, how do teachers help with integrity when it comes to work, especially quizzes and tests? Can you say that question again? I think you cut out for a second. Yeah, how do teachers help with integrity when it comes to um, their work, especially with quizzes and tests? Yeah, so I think we've kind of touched on this a little bit about the authentic assessments, right? That, that an assessment doesn't have to look like a 50 question multiple choice test. That's not that because we're, we give assessments to make sure that students understand the content all right, or to assess whether or not the students understand the content. So can that assessment be more authentic to the content and not about just grading the test as quickly as possible right now? Um, we don't, we don't need to worry about going back to Scantron days where students filled in bubbles and stuff. What kind of assessments are we giving to students? And there is really no reason at this point to give every single student the same assessment. It's just, there's no point, at the, it, 
right now, you know, especially if you're going to be using more technology and things that would kind of self grade or automate some of that process for you, then just open it wide up and just, and, and think about how you might restructure some of those assessments to actually get authentic assessment uh, data from your students and not just they got an 80%, they got a 60%. So the 60% must not understand it as good as the 80% did. Yeah, I think um, main themes I'm hearing from you are, uh, you know, differentiation, creativity, and choice with students and assessments. Um, mm -hmm. I guess to wrap it up, what is one piece of advice or something you'd advise uh, teachers to keep in mind as they're kind of altering their teaching tactics for remote learning and how that will affect um, their teaching style when they go back to the classroom. Yeah, so there, I think there's really two things that I would suggest teachers, I want, I want to say that I suggest they focus on in the, the ending weeks of, of the school year. The first is remember that they're still teaching humans, that even though they're over a computer, that they're still working with human beings and just be flexible in everybody's needs. And, and like, they, like we said, you know, taking care of the teacher's needs as well, um, not putting too much pressure on themselves to be this all-star amazing you know award-winning teacher during this time like this is unprecedented so we should be using unprecedented tactics right um, and then the other thing that I would recommend teachers do in the next couple weeks is give a survey to their students about what they liked about remote learning what did they like about remote learning? And this could be applicable to your class or just overall, what did you like? Not about like, what did you like about the content or how I delivered things, just in general. Did you like that you could learn on your couch? Did you like that you had a choice of when you began your lessons or how long it took, or if it was something was easy, you, you could skip through it. Um, you know, flipped learning has been a phenomenon for a few years in terms of teachers creating lessons, sending them out to the students as homework, and then the student coming back and the classroom being more of the um, student work time and questions and things like that. And I, I used to do that in my classroom. And one of the, the things the students said they liked about flipped learning was one, that they could pause the lesson at any point when they didn't understand something and they could rewind. And the second one, and this was hilarious to me when the students told me this, was that they could mute the lesson. They didn't <laughs> want to hear necessarily what I was saying. They were, because I was a math teacher, so they were watching me work out the problem. And if they needed to hear it, then they could. Or they used closed captioning or something along those lines, right? So it's, it's funny the things that they pull out that they like about those unique learning experiences. So survey your students over the next couple weeks and just ask them. And then think through those results, are there any items on here that I could make available to my students on a regular basis, right? The flexible seating has been around for a little while, flexible seating, but I think a lot more students are going to be fed up with going back to a classroom and sitting at a desk. They are not going to want to do that because they've been learning on their couch or in their backyard or, you know, wherever they were comfortable learning, you know, I think pajama days should be every Friday in the elementary school just because <laughs> my kids are way more comfortable when they're just in comfortable clothes. Same thing with teachers, right? What I've learned is that I can do my job just as well in comfortable clothes as I can in fancy clothes. <laughs> so, you know, it's just some of those things that I think we can we can look back at this time and say, you know, what, this is what I learned about myself and I want to continue that habit once this is all over. Yeah, I think that's a great, great lesson and something everyone, you know, no matter what industry you can, yeah. you're, you can do. Um, I know I've been keeping like a journal for this time, kind of thinking about what I do in my day that's different that I want to implement when we go back to normal. Mm -hmm. And I think for students, especially to, for them to be aware of those um, things that they like and dislike, that's so important. Um, that's kind of all that we had today. This was a great discussion and I really appreciate you taking the time to talk with us again this week. I know you're probably pretty busy, um, but thank you so much for joining us. Is there anything else that you would like to say or anything uh, you have coming up that you wanna talk about? 
No, I don't think so. Teachers, you're doing a great job. Just keep it up. Give yourself a little grace. Lean on the people like me that are here to support you. We're not annoyed with your questions. We, I promise, you know, we'll get to you. And for everybody, all humans, just get outside and like go for a hike or something. We're going to go to do a hike later this afternoon as a family. So just get out in nature because it's a beautiful spring. Yes. The weather is finally nice here in Indiana. Yes. <laughs> We're hoping that it'll last. Um, thank you so much, Sarah, for joining us. Um, have a great rest of your day. Enjoy your hike later. Um, and we'll hope to talk to you soon. Thank you. Okay, bye.